Um, awesome. So I think with with that, we'll go ahead and jump in. Um, welcome everyone. Very excited to have everyone here for this conversation uh, with Omar from African Invest. Uh, I think it's going to be a fascinating discussion around how a one of Africa's largest private equity funds decided to get involved in the uh, venture capital space and how they're leveraging both their in-house um, networks and frameworks and, and structure, as well as some global partnerships to, to do what they do. Um, I'll let Omar, you, you kind of speak to some of the details, but the fund has been around for about a little over a year, maybe two years about now, um, and has made four investments, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so for, for those that are just tuning in, um, yeah, we'll get into all of the details there. I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Alicia. I am uh, typically based in Silicon Valley, currently in Atlanta, Georgia, enjoying all of this good humidity here in the South. Um, I am the host of the Africa Invest in Africa uh, webinar. <clears throat> and the intention with this webinar is really just to highlight the practitioners that are investing on the continent as a way of both demystifying the, the, the processes as well as highlighting you know, who's actually doing the investment work. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned, very excited to have Omar here today. Omar, I'll pass it to you just to provide a, a personal intro and then maybe a bit about how you got involved into uh, Africa Invest. Thank you, Alicia. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to be, uh, to be here today. Um, so my name is Omar Lalej. Uh, I was born and raised uh, in Meknes, which is where I'm currently today, uh, an imperial, uh, although my filter may be a bit uh, misleading. Um, Meknes is an imperial city that used to be the capital of Morocco in the 17th century. And so growing up in a middle-class family, I had the, the privilege to attend the French middle high school uh, from which I graduated in 2003 with a scientific uh, baccalaureate. Uh, as my childhood dream was uh, actually to become a professional tennis player and uh, in an attempt to keep the dream alive, I uh, decided to play college tennis in the US while uh, pursuing a bachelor's degree. And so fast forward a few years, I graduated from college in 2008, arguably the worst time in history to graduate with a, a degree in finance and accounting. Um, luckily, I had a couple of opportunities to choose from. Uh, one provided a lot of visibility on job security as it was a full-time role at BlackRock, which where I had interned the summer prior. The other was a bit more risky uh, uh, and entailed a three to six month internship with no guarantees at Grand Partners, which is a middle market private equity firm based in suburban Philadelphia. Call me crazy, I went for the internship, uh, which then turned uh, into an analyst role. Um, then I had a couple of uh, roles under the private equity umbrella, first as a corporate development and M&A manager of life sciences business um, in North America. And then uh, as a finance manager at uh, Elo Touch Solutions, which is a tech company in the Silicon Valley. Um, in 2014, I uh, came to Morocco to, want to attend one of my cousin's weddings. And uh, he met with one of the senior partners at African Invest, who invited me to join the PE team in Morocco. Um, and uh, the rest is history, really. It's been... Uh, a very exciting journey so far. It's been over six years now. And my role on a personal level has evolved uh, since joining the group as we developed uh, an Africa-focused uh, um, VC strategy. And I'll, I'll be happy to tell you uh, on how that came about. Yeah, I think, we can, I think we can go ahead and jump right into it. So what, what sparked the interest in the VC fund? And then how did you all go about getting that started and off the ground? Absolutely. So maybe a quick intro on Africa Invest, which is yep, a multi-strategy uh, investment platform that was created in 1994 in, in Tunisia and is today one of the most prominent uh, investors on the continent with uh, 1.9 billion dollars uh, uh, of assets under management. So we're getting close to 2 billion. Um, the firm operates in a number of different areas, including private equity, which remains the core business. Um, and some specialized strategies, including private debt and venture capital. Um, so 20 years ago, in early 2000s, the team at the time had tried um, to go into a Pan-African innovation uh, vehicle, but the time was not uh, necessarily the right one, uh, given uh, the level of maturity of the market to absorb VC capital. And so the team 
uh, had set up a, a, a small vehicle dedicated to the Tunisian market. And out of the 19 vehicles that we raced to date, it's been one of the most successful ones. Um, and so fast forward uh, a few years in 2017, things had changed uh, and markets had matured. And we had noticed a clear excitement around entrepreneurship in Africa and for Africa. So we wanted to understand why. Uh, as a first step, we decided to form a very small team of what we like to call founders within the African Invest team to look into this. And, and we're supported by not only our peers uh, and our team members uh, across the continent, but also to, with uh, a number of MBA students from, from Columbia and Cambridge that we onboarded to kind of help us uh, understand the, the mechanics uh, wearing a VC, uh, VC hat investor. Can I, can and so I there were. Is, sure. it, is it okay if I just pause you here? So sure. what I'm hearing is you actually had like an R&D team doing a lot of the maybe uh, micro microeconomic analysis, um, micro and mark, ooh, micro and uh, macro economic analysis. How did you, I guess, how did you all, was that at an internship capacity? Was that actually like a paid service, especially since they were students? How did that, how did that actually work? Yeah, it's funny how the timing worked out. We have uh, relationships on an ongoing basis with, with Colombia. Um, and so we have a program where uh, they, um, they refer certain students to, to us uh, and they come uh, join us in some voluntary capacity or they join us for the summer for to, to, to have internships. Uh, and so these are MBA students that are interested by what goes on in Africa in emerging markets, VC, PE, et cetera. And so we had this project and we interacted with, with both Columbia and Cambridge um, uh, to conduct these studies. And uh, for us, it was a real case study because we actually were intrigued by what was going on in the VC landscape in Africa. Mm -hmm. And so it was, uh, um, you know, the, the students that participated in, in, in the study can say now that the project they worked on is, is uh, live and well uh, and, and growing. So uh, for them, it was a very rewarding experience and I hope uh, that they uh, um, that they enjoyed the, being a part of our team. I was wondering um, if people that do that. Sorry, no, I was wondering if people that do that end up starting their own fund because they have all of this market research themselves. They're like, oh, actually, there's an interesting opportunity here. Maybe I should go <laughs> take advantage of this. I hope they do. I hope they do one day. I think the more the merrier, and there's room for a lot more people. It's a big continent, and uh, there's a lot of opportunity for everyone. So sorry to interrupt. So you were saying that you, you were you recruited this team of uh, MBA students, and they helped kind of draft what ended up becoming the thesis for the fund. Absolutely. And so maybe it would be helpful to share some of the key takeaways yeah. that encouraged us to go that way, right? So first, and and mind you, given the audience here today uh, um, comes from all, all all places around the globe, these numbers may seem quite small, particularly as they pertain to the Silicon Valley and, and more developed markets. But uh, think of Africa and VC in Africa's early stage, right? So for some context, um, the ecosystem in 2017 was just coming together. Uh, but the pace of venture capital going into uh, the market was growing significantly. So it had grown by nine times from 2012 to 2017, for example. So number of funds raised at the time were $360 million. Uh, but, um, but it's still relatively small in dollar size, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting is that we had seen the emergence of four regional hubs, right? Cape Town, Lagos, Nairobi, and Cairo. And so by 2018, that same VC activity had reached a billion dollars, so it more than doubled. And then in 2019, it reached $2 billion, mm -hmm. which was maintained in 2020. So it means that there's more and more appetite for VC investments on the African continent. So that's okay. number one. Number two, um, we noticed that the combination of African social economy gaps and innovation drivers are creating massive opportunities for African ventures to leapfrog. In other words, mm -hmm. overcoming these gaps faster, uh, efficiently, including costs, and more importantly, in adapted fashion, right? So you cannot just take everything that worked in a place and apply it to the, another place. I mean, you have to, to adapt, but there were tools that were going to uh, be uh, built and utilized to address these issues. And so maybe I can highlight some of the gaps that we had noticed, right? So Africa today continues to have pressing gaps in access to energy, basic health, 
education, financial inclusion, digital services. I mean, if I just take a one stat, it's quite incredible. 61% of adults today or do not possess a financial bank or institutional account, nor do they have access to a mobile money, ser mobile money service, right? Um, and so that's just a massive opportunity for financial products and services to be deployed in a very large capacity, um, thanks to the innovation that's available today. Mm -hmm. Another big issue is the low productivity and poor infrastructure across multiple sectors, which limits the continent's economy growth, right? So you have also inadequate regulation as some markets are closed for competition with limitations on trade, on uh, investments, uh, financial transactions. And so while these gaps are quite large and obvious, there are also a lot of opportunities to address them. Um, and so we spent a lot of time drawing parallels between some of these gaps that we noticed in Africa versus similar issues that had transpired in emerging markets outside of Africa that went through similar trajectories and we realized that each challenge creates a unique opportunity for innovation. Right. So Africa today's uh, educated and digitally included youth are the biggest game changer for the future, mm -hmm. right? And I'll tell you a bit more uh, on that a bit later. Um, you know, building new applications uh, and breakthroughs that will lead to, to a better uh, population, uh, better continents. Mobile money and fintechs, we talked about lack of financial inclusion, you know, right. off-grid solar and PAYGO models that are more and more adapted in East Africa and that are bringing access to energy to the most remote uh, uh, rural populations in, those in, in, in many countries around the continent. And the development of su super consumer apps, so whether it's on the payment side, whether it's integrated to existing financial systems uh, and so on and so forth. We even see one of our portfolio companies has developed a software for for drone um, for drone um, uh, imagery that helps farmers better understand how their uh, trees are being uh, are being uh, watered and, and and how healthy they are at each and, and every given point in time. So uh, innovation is really uh, bringing um, light on things that will take years for us to solve if we go in a more traditional manner. On the regulatory front, we also see more and more. Oh, you're breaking up a little, Omar. For emission bills, you know, the most recent. Sorry, uh, I was talking about regulators uh, okay. that are passing pro in innovation bills. Uh, and the most recent example I could, I could think of is uh, the draft open banking framework. Um, currently contemplated by the Central Bank of Nigeria. So mm -hmm. promoting innovation and, and allowing fintechs to have access to, to bank data uh, that is extremely large and unexploited today, right? So right. you see that even the regulators are, are being more open-minded and embracing innovation. Mm -hmm. So these, these are important things. The third uh, item that we also noticed and encouraged us to, to venture into this is that the African VC market remains unevenly distributed and underserved at yeah. series A and series B level, right? So you had a lot of, not a lot, but some money going into seed and, and, and family money. If when people had good ideas and wanted to start their project, you had funds like the ones we manage on the private equity side um, that were addressing mature businesses, profitable businesses, relatively stable that were looking to scale but no one was really addressing the middle. Right. And that middle is really what can make a big difference, right? And then finally, uh, to make sure that investment can be whole, you have to exit. And for you right. to exit, we noticed that um, er early growth stage PE funds um, as we're starting to mature in Africa. So for an early stage investor to come in, it provided opportunities for VC investors to have an additional way of exiting efficiently and relatively comfortably if things were able to, to mature um, in, as they were supposed to. So that was, if you will, the four elements that uh, helped us go for it. And so I guess at that point, you've, you guys have done this due diligence, you've kind of come together with, this is why there's a compelling case for 
African Invest, the private equity fund to move into venture capital. I guess kind of talk us through what what that looked like. And then as far as getting maybe your the the executive leadership on the PE side to say like, yes, go ahead. And then maybe speak to us a little bit about the structure. So is African Invest, the private equity fund, an LP? You know, we have Kathy Innovation now also coming into the mix. How how did you kind of get from this ideation to full fund development? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, so in addition to our exciting investment strategy uh, and our tech enable approach to, to investments, right? Mind you, again, I refer back to, to the audience. We're not necessarily looking at deep tech or R&D projects that take many, many years to, to, to come together. Uh, we're, we're a bit um, realistic in, in the way that uh, we approach things. And so while we assess a lot of opportunities, and I'll tell you a bit more about that a bit later on yeah. the statistic front, but uh, we take what has perhaps worked as well, adapt it to the local context, and then and back it, support it, and fuel it with resources, network, et cetera. And so as we develop that mindset, uh, we partnered up with a strategic partner, which is Cathay Innovation which uh, is one of the most prominent VC investors today uh, worldwide, uh, who brings additional experience, an extended network, and a larger footprint. Um, so if I just give you a few examples of some of the deals that Cate Innovation uh, has done, um, you know, Pinjujo, uh, which is one of the largest social commerce platforms in, in China, and mm -hmm. actually IPO'd uh, in, in the NASDAQ, Cate was one of their early investors. Wow. Uh, Ledger in France, uh, uh, Cathay was involved uh, very early on Chime Bank, which you might know of in, in, the, in the US. Cathay was one of their early stage investors. Oh. Glovo, Glovo that you guys might know of and use in Europe and in Africa, Cathay was also one of their early uh, investors. So they have very strong experience backing, supporting and scaling early stage investments worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, but they didn't have presence in Africa, right? And so instead for them to to start from, from scratch and build a platform in Africa, we thought we would join forces and for us to have also to be able to tap into their network right. in places where we're not necessarily pleasant, presence, present, sorry, and, and create a, a, a multi-dimensional uh, uh, platform. And did, sorry, just to interrupt you here. So did, is that something that you all sought out? I guess I'm curious how that partnership and that relationship even came to fruition. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, the founders, uh, Ming Pokai and, and Aziz Mubarak knew each other, and the founders of both uh, African Invest and and, uh, and and Cathay knew of each other. They actually met at a conference, shared notes, talked about their ongoing projects, and and thought this could make a lot of sense for us to partner mm -hmm. up. And you know, we started uh, involving the, the larger teams, and uh, there was a natural fit. We have very similar mindsets. They're great people, and uh, we're extremely happy to to collaborate with them uh, on this on this project. And so they're they're part they're involved in the governance of the fund, you know they participate in the screening, the uh, process, the investment committee uh, at the GP level as well. Mm -hmm. They also bring very strong links with Chinese and European corporations that are eager to promote uh, innovation, which could improve both the growth and the exit prospects of our current and future portfolio companies. Um, so yeah, we're very excited about the partnership. And so that that partnership, it sounds like, was really came to fruition out of a natural like understanding that there was some synergy. I'm curious too, was there was there any vetting? I mean, they're they're a globally recognized fund. They're also incredibly massive. So I think at that point, there's enough validation based on what they've been able to accomplish. But I'm curious if there was any vetting that went into that relationship. And even from the private equity side on African Invest, you know, was that did they did they require any particular? Um, data points from Cathay Innovation to ensure like, yes, we're willing to move forward on this. <laughs> it's interesting you asked the question. To be honest, it's been a, a such a fluid process that it didn't feel like they were going into due diligence, we were going into due diligence. Mm -hmm. I think there was a mutual uh, understanding that took place very early on. There was a lot of trust between both parties uh, that took place really early on. Uh, mind you, they, their history is, is quite similar to African Vets history in a sense that they started with a private equity platform connecting France and China and China and France. Mm. And so an African Vest also started uh, in, with a private equity platform 
first in Tunisia, then Morocco, then Algeria, then Sub-Saharan Africa, then Europe. And so that's a cross-border investing uh, as part of what we do on a daily basis. And so there was a big match in mindset. And then we both evolved towards the innovation sector. They, were, they went there uh, a few years before us. And uh, you know, our teams really clicked and, um, and the rest is, uh, was pretty straightforward. And so, as you were mentioning, Kathy Innovation is, is serves as an LP in the fund. I guess what is then African? No, it's not. It's, it's not an LP in the fund. It's, oh, they're not. Uh, they're parts of. They're, it's parts of a GP. Sorry, GP. They're that's part, a fund. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're parts of the GP. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, but it's an important. No, no, no thank you for <laughs> thank you for clarifying. So they're they're part of the GP of the fund. Then I guess so for African Invest, the private equity fund, are they? I guess what role do they? Are they an LP? Are they a GP? Um, how have you been able to attract LPs into the fund? Yeah, What's so, the pushback? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. So we co-manage the GP. Uh, African mm -hmm. Invest manages the day-to-day. -day, um, and so we're both um, uh, shareholders of the GP and we both have responsibility of managing the GP. Uh, African Invest has the majority. So we are involved with a dedicated team um, that uh, manages the day-to-day. -day. And then we also have resources from Cate's team that is, part, uh, you know, um, uh, participating in the governance of the fund. So we have weekly meetings, we have our strategic committees, we have our investment committees, we have our board reviews. We get on call together to conduct due diligence and specific uh, uh, opportunities. We tap into their network of corporates. Uh, we tap into their uh, fundraising um, teams that help us fundraise for the fund. Um, and so it's been a, a, a natural collaboration Wow. Um, to uh, to try to convince LPs to join us. And, and luckily, there's been a, a lot of traction um, uh, happening as a result uh, of the uh, of the elements I mentioned uh, earlier. And I don't know if we've shared this with the audience already, but can you just uh, give us a sense of how large the fund is? Um, what are the typical check sizes? Just some of the kind of deployment details? Absolutely. So the fund is uh, today... We are uh, finalizing a, a third closing at 72 million euros. Um, wow. So our goal is to reach uh, 100 million by uh, by the end of October, which is the deadline for us to uh, uh, to close uh, our our first uh, joint fund. Um, so we're at 72 today. We write uh, investment checks ranging from 1 million euros to 10 million euros. Our sweet spot is at three between three and four million as a first check, and then we leave leave some dry powder to follow on in subsequent rounds as the companies continue to scale and, and need cash to to continue to grow. Um, so that's been our positioning. From a from a, from a portfolio structure perspective, are you are you kind of benchmarking or um, maybe reserving you know upwards of ten million per company, knowing that like the first check will be three million and then you have potentially seven million to play with. Um, curious if you can kind of share with us how you all thought about what the portfolio structure would look like. Yeah, no, it, from a, of course, we, um, we keep that in mind uh, and we have um, uh, checks and balances, if, if you will, right? So uh, we do have, we see opportunities, on, as I mentioned to you uh, during uh, our um, uh, prep calls, if you will, for, ahead of this, uh, of this uh, webinar. Uh, we do see quite a few uh, opportunities on a daily basis. So it's ranging from two to three. For example, in 2020, we looked at 907 deals and we only picked four of them, right? So that's a 0.4% conversion rate. So we're extremely selective uh, wow. in our process. Um, and so the process from sourcing to exit is really designed to maximize the potential value, the potential of value creation uh, in the funds mm -hmm portfolio company, uh, address key obstacles standing in their the way of their growth and improve the performance of the portfolio. So depending on which one of those is in the life of their development, we then not only have a reserved powder for them, but we also operate on, on an as needed basis based on what's on, on the opportunities we see in the markets. Um, so that's kind of like how we've been thinking about the portfolio. And um, and, and if you look at the, the targeted size of our fund and the investment tickets we want to dedicate for each, you know, uh, we are at 100 million size, give or take, that's our goal. 
Um, so we'll have um, ideally today we have six portfolio companies. We're about to close on our seventh after nice. a year and, and, and five months of operations. Um, so we're a bit ahead of schedule um, and we're, um, we're excited to continue to deploy um, in the next few uh, months and years. So maybe just to take a step back for, for audience members and folks that have just joined, I think what's exciting to me about African Invest is that it's, it's nestled within kind of the existing framework of a private equity fund. And then you have this global partnership that you can leverage for fundraising, for you know, like due diligence, for understanding what are the global market trends and you know emerging or growing markets. Um, so from a from a I guess from a due diligence standpoint, from an access to just data in general, I think that for me is the, what's been fascinating because I I know that for a lot of aspiring investors or investors, it's like where do you get market research on what's happening on the ground? So maybe at this point you can talk a little bit about. Um, you know, the sourcing process and then kind of the due diligence that goes into uh, any, any investment that you're, you know, you're, you're doing due diligence on. Absolutely. So just maybe for the audience, it's important to mention that the, the Cathay Africa Invest Innovation Fund invests primarily in post-revenue generating startups in multiple sectors or so sector agnostic in Africa or targeting the African continent. So we created a global platform that backs three types of startups. African companies looking to scale regionally and continentally. Mm -hmm. Then we look at African companies looking to scale internationally. And finally, uh, and what's, that's what's also unique and innovative in our uh, platform is we look at international companies looking to scale in Africa. And, and, and the way we, we source and, and manage uh, our deal flow is, is a few folds. Number one, we leverage our presence in a combined 18 offices globally between our eight offices in eight countries in Africa through the mm -hmm. African Invest platform, including the main innovation hubs that I mentioned earlier, with local teams where we selected one representative of the VC strategy to dedicate up to 25% of their time sourcing deals and managing challenges and opportunities on the ground. And number two, Cate has presence in the main innovation hubs worldwide, in San Francisco, in New York, in Paris, in Shanghai, in Hong Kong, and in Singapore for Southeast Asia. So that's, that's number one. And then beyond region and industry, it's also important to highlight our investment framework, which is a bit uh, unique in the way we go to market. The fund really focuses its investment on um, innovative ventures across what we call four main innovation themes, okay? Number one is universal access providers. Uh, you know, they're companies that have come up with a service or products that allow the populations to have access to a something, something that they couldn't have access to or they, it was too expensive to have access to. Then we look at value chain builders, you know, a product or a service that really bolts on things that are extremely fragmented. Or we look at African optimizers, you know, products or services that optimize the way we do things, the way we consume, the way we travel, the way we go to work, the way we uh, pay our bills, uh, and so on and so forth. And then finally, we look at global disruptors. So it's really things that have, uh, are going to change the way we operate and, and, and conduct things. And so from our research and experience, ventures that achieved success in the past years have strongly displayed alignment to more than one of these uh, innovation themes regardless mm. of the sector that they belong to, oh, right? So we go beyond the sector agnostic piece. We just look at things that will make this a success over time. And unlike traditional PE um, in, in Africa or unlike um, specialized VC strategies in more developed markets, deal sourcing is, is a challenge in a different way. Um, we're really looking for the for the diamond in the rock, as uh, one of my colleagues, Anne, likes to say. Uh, it's, it's as important to say no fast to focus on what's really interesting, right? right? And so that's, that's, been key, that's been our key motto going into decision-making. And as such, to help us do that, we decided to invest in a custom IT solution that not only helps us source deals, but manage deal flow in-house. And so when I talked about the 900 plus opportunities, we looked at nine, uh, last year, there was no way we could have just kept track of it on Excel. Right. Uh, it's just not possible. And, 
and we would have lost a lot of things in on along the way. So this is kind of like how we're we're structured. So are you saying that you all developed a proprietary technology to help with the management of your deal flow? Is that is that what I'm hearing? I wouldn't call it a, a technology because it's off the shelf, but we customized it okay. in a way that addresses our specific needs. Um, and so oh. we we uh, we uh, called upon uh, an advisor in the markets um, that um, has these type of solutions, and we built one that really is special to to our own platform and our own needs. And so maybe piggybacking on that, I guess, how then do these satellite offices come into play when you start doing due diligence? Could you give us maybe an example of what that process looks like? Yeah, sure. So uh, depending on where the deal comes from, uh, if it's sourced from Nairobi, um, you know, our, our colleague Faisal, for instance, or George or, or Julius will, will give us a call or they will share with us the opportunity. They'll send us the deck. Uh, we'll get on a call with the manage with the founders or the management team. We'll try to understand the business, and uh, and then they will help us, uh, um, you know, with the reputation check. They will help us with uh, understanding um, and troubleshooting some of the stories that they're telling us, some of the key point pain points that they're trying to solve. And so having those boots on the ground really uh, help us differentiate our approach. Make help us understand faster, better, in a more uh, pragmatic way. And this, uh, and this setup if was with, of boots on the ground has really been um, uh, interesting to observe um, through the COVID pe period, because uh, where people couldn't have the opportunity to get on a plane to go check out uh, what's going on themselves on the ground, we had local people who understand the local constraints and the, call, and, the, and the potential solutions uh, to help us figure it out without having to uh, to go from point A to point B. So from a scalability perspective, while it may seem like a large upfront investment, it turns out to be quite efficient. Um, and so, yeah, and, and once we invest uh, and, 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 and the, uh, the local uh, team members help us also monitor uh, the evolution of, of the of our investments, um, mm -hmm. and so they help us also um, get uh, views and, and feedback uh, on the competitive landscape, on on potential regulatory issues, challenges, opportunities. Uh, so to help uh, our companies execute and scale their uh, their business plan. We have a question from the the audience that I think is fitting for right now. This is from Adama. Um, what is the typical profile of a startup you look at? Expected MRR, TAM, number of employees, founders, background, pretty much all, all the details. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. So we typically look at, uh, like I mentioned, post-revenue businesses. MRR usually exceed $100,000 uh, or euros. Um, so on a run rate basis, you know, we look at um, companies that generate uh, about a million dollars of annualized revenue. Oh. And... Um, and, and the background of the founders, you know, we need to understand uh, where they're coming from, what their, uh, what their track record has been, um, the solution and the, that they bring into the, to the market, whether it's through a product or a service, um, how sticky that, that solution can be, uh, where, the, where do they operate from a uh, competitive landscape perspective, what markets are they operated in, um, you know what their unit economics look like. Uh, are they? Uh, is their model uh, scalable? Can be profitable at scale? Uh, is the addressable market large enough? Um, and so, uh, because you know, at some point we need to seek uh, 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 interest and appetite from either strategic players or secondary buyers that could uh, have an interest in continuing to grow uh, these type of products and services. Um, so these are some of the things that uh, that we like to see. Mm -hmm. um, and we are extremely data driven. Um, most of our founders and, and, and colleagues are, are engineers by background. And so we take uh, great pride in looking at numbers very closely. So, so maybe piggybacking back on that, um, one of the things that I found interesting in our uh, prep call was you were mentioning Hitch, which if you wanna give a little background on that, um, but you were mentioning how with Hitch, you were the fund was actually really more support, supporting their go-to-market strategy. And then you mentioned that, you know, one of the key kind of like advantages that Afrique Invest has is the ability to kind of understand 
the localization potential of some of these companies. So could you kind of talk to us about that maybe through the lens of, of your investment in Hitch? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a pretty good example. And I, after Hitch, if you don't mind, I'll also like to highlight uh, a couple more companies that give you yeah. an idea of the type of businesses we've been back in. Um, so Hitch was one of our first investments um, that we invested in October 2019, really as we closed the fund. So we had the opportunity to invest. We just needed to, to finalize the legal documentation to, to make it happen. And, um, and so Hitch is a ride hailing platform based out of Paris. They're a number two player in Paris. And um, um, after uh, investing, and their view is to uh, scale their operations in Africa. So they came to Morocco. Uh, where they quickly became uh, the fastest growing red hailing player and the number one red right hailing player uh, in Morocco after Uber left the country uh, three, four years ago. Um, and um, they also wanted to scale their operations in Algeria, then Cameroon and then Angola. And so based on our setup and, and local uh, experience, we helped them scale their operations in these countries, uh, right? So having presence on the ground, especially when regulation for ride hailing is still a bit blurry. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of constraints around uh, having the authorization authority to operate a, a, um, a, a, VTC, uh, a VTC platform without having a transportation license mm -hmm. in um, your countries of operations uh, is tricky. And that's one actually one of the reasons why Uber decided to leave in, in a few years ago Right. Uh, because um, it just became unsustainable for them to manage not only regulators, but also um, their competition, which is uh, which was uh, taxis and taxi drivers. And so did that mean so, you all were help? Sorry, just interrupt. Um, did that mean you all were helping them understand the local regulations? Were you introducing them to local regulators that could then advise on, you know, maybe what path they might take forward? Curious kind of what that actually looked like. Uh, you know, beyond helping them and with introductions, uh, I think introductions, a lot of people can do. Yeah. Um, and so we're not unique um, just from the uh, introduction perspective. Uh, we are entrepreneurs at heart. And so mm -hmm. when, what, like Amazon says, we help companies from day zero. Mm -hmm. And so when we, we're, we really try to help them with business development. And when it goes to the business development, it really goes down to sitting down with the founders or the management team and trying to address issues as they come or as they may come. Uh, and so for the instance of each, it, not only was it to deal with regulators, but it's, it's actually more to make taxis embrace the technology and, and have a platform where they can actually have more freedom and have more leeway to work their own hours and have their own customer base as opposed to waiting in line for three hours before picking up their first customer for the day, right? So it became a solution that addresses a pain point that works with uh, competition or, or what could be perceived as competition because in reality, it's not competition. Each is an enabler for a, to grow the pie uh, of, of taxi drivers. And so we really try to think through opportunities for them to scale their businesses. And I think what I'm hearing you say too, that I think is really powerful is, you know, the, the way that you're advising them is as far as like a localization or a go to market strategy is like, let's really understand what are the pain points of local taxi drivers? And then how would you modify the technology to then actually address that? Like in, in the broad scale of ride hailing, but like specifically in Algeria, what is, what is that pain point and how do we offer that solution? So that's, so that everybody's kind of like flocking to the technology. I think that's really, Absolutely. really powerful. Absolutely, that's, that's been our motto. And, um, and, and we've been trying to do that across the board, not only with Heach, but with other, other interesting uh, platforms that we decided to back. So maybe I can give you a couple of more examples yeah. um, that, can, that can speak to that. Um, the second uh, company we invested in is a company called KaiOS. Um, so KaiOS, today, if, if I look at the operating system ecosystem, that, that was not intended, but <laughs> if I look at the uh, ecosystem of operating systems in the world, uh, there are three ma major players. You have iOS for iPhones, you have uh, Android for most smartphones today in the market. And then the third one uh, is an operating system for feature phones. Uh, and so this light operating system allows uh, 
uh, to transform affordable feature phones with limited technical resources into a smartphone and mm -hmm. therefore offering internet access to the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, and so this company has uh, established a user base of 135 million. So 100, most of those are India today, but the next targeted market is Africa, right? Uh, and so they help the underserved African population access mobile internet and the <laughs> myriad of digital services associated with uh, internet, really, and knowing that uh, in Africa, 800 million people have no internet access. Oh, yeah. And 400 million of those people are using feature phones. So I talked earlier about the addressable market. This is a huge addressable market. Mm -hmm. And so beyond providing just access to a basic need, which most of us would consider a basic need, it's actually, it could be life-changing. It also helps create jobs for building a larger community of KOS developers in the African Af market for the African market. So, so for us, this is um, an interesting business that we're very excited to, uh, to back and support as they continue to scale their operations um, in Africa. Another one that I would like to highlight uh, is a company called Boomplay that some of you here in the audience might have heard of. Uh, some of my colleagues like to call it the Spotify for Africa. So it's, oh, it's, a, it's, it's a highly social music streaming application that has, and note this, more users than Twitter and Instagram combined in Nigeria. And wow. so it, it's, quite, it's quite massive, it's quite sticky, and it, it actually solves a, a real pain point because it digitizes and formalizes a largely illicit market where artists have little control on the use of their music in local yeah. medias and events, right? Um, and so for us, it's, it's extremely exciting because it's, it's a platform in Africa for Africa that has a beautiful African music content um, that is uh, quite addicting, I must say. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. I was actually just reading an article where the, the author was stating if you streamed an, um, an album on repeat nonstop 24-7 for a year, the artist only gets like $300 uh in re in streaming revenue and so i mean the argument that they were making is that uh streaming platforms should become um like common goods and so i i'll be fully honest i didn't finish reading the article but i thought it was just really fascinating i was like this is actually a really big challenge and then on top of that i think i was reading um that spotify is going the social route as well like they're trying to get a clubhouse feature in there so that you can kind of so that artists can converse with um, with their listeners. So yeah, that's it's fascinating to hear that there's already, and I've never heard of this company. What was it called again? Boom Play. Boom Play. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So um, I hope uh, I hope you will download the app and, and listen to uh, some cool African music. <laughs> um, so they have two models. They have a freemium model and a subscription-based model, you know, classic, uh, mm -hmm. if you will. But uh, but uh, it's, it's uh, we hope that, uh, this will uh, bring more and more uh, people onto the platform to, to support local artists and, 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 local, uh, uh, and local ecosystems uh, because we're African communities are full of talents and yeah. these type of platforms uh, can only enhance uh, their, their skill sets. Um, a third company, uh, sorry, did you want, did you want well, to Well, I guess I just wanted uh, to, to understand for that company in particular, was the role that you all are playing in localization, it sounded like they were already in Nigeria. I guess I'm curious kind of the, the localization role that or how you guys are specifically supporting them, whether it's business development or otherwise. Yeah, it's, it's, it's on the business development side. It's also um, given our presence in Nigeria with many investments on the ground uh, and an office in, uh, in, in Nigeria, we, we will help them um, navigate, if you will, uh, the various opportunities that they see in the in the markets you know whether it's discussing with uh, music uh, providers whether it's uh, just talking to distribution partners whether it's talking to marketers that are interested in promoting certain events mm -hmm. whether it's uh, uh, it's uh, helping them with customer acquisition whether it's integrating uh, with our other investments uh, on the fintech side to to facilitate uh, that social uh, characteristic that the that the platform has uh, by by making it easier for people to do 
peer-to-peer uh, -peer payments, for instance. We invested in another company called Pompey that, that, that ambitions to become the Venmo for Africa, right? Mm. Um, um, and so we, we want to make sure that, you know, KaiOS is providing a, a user experience uh, that is seamless and that can, uh, has a music feature on it, uh, including payments uh, for people to, to select from uh, their, their areas of preference. And so we're not only do we think about uh, standalone businesses, but we also think portfolio and we think synergies, both on the operational side and on the commercial side. Uh, and so this is an ongoing effort that continues to evolve as we, as we monitor the investment. And then I know you wanted to talk about another co uh, company, but if I could go back to Hitch quickly, um, sure. just when you were talking about supporting with the the business development component, I guess I'm curious to what extent is that your office, your office being um, the core team of the fund versus some of the the VCs that you're that are supporting that kind of have that 25% capacity. I guess I'm curious to what extent is that that engagement kind of ongoing. <clears throat> No, that's a, that's a very good uh, question because it can uh, it can create a, a little bit of um, you know time management, um, mm -hmm. and so maybe I can take a step back and just walk you through how how we actually uh, assign teams post investment. So after investment is closed, we typically assign one or two members of the deal team that actually worked on the transaction to continue monitoring the investment mm -hmm. through board directorship or board observer roles. And so our team then carefully monitors the investment on an ongoing basis. And then we do involve the local teams to support us in the ongoing efforts. Um, so it's not their day job to monitor our investments. Their day job is to support us on an as needed basis and to make sure that um, if, uh, if needed or if we need some uh, market intelligence, we need some uh, meetings and, 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 and regulatory uh, context, we can have access to that. Uh, we can have uh, uh, local support to understand the context uh, in, in, in case uh, certain issues arise. And so it's really more about um, a collective effort that mm -hmm. is managed by our core team with support from our uh, local teams. I see. Um, I think looking at the time, I, I think I'll wind down with a couple of um, just kind of like high level reflective questions and then I want to pull in some questions um, here from the audience. Could you, um, I'm just curious, because it sounds like there's such an amazing infrastructure and you guys are highly selective, I'm curious, you know, what, what challenges you all are facing or maybe what's the top one or two challenges you experience um, running this fund? Mm -hmm. Oh, look, so it's, uh, that's a good question. One of the biggest challenges continues to be fundraising. Uh, it's, uh, it's still not oh. easy to convince uh, a foreign investor um, who may have some perception issues about Africa to join the party. Um, and so that's number one. Number two, um, we, we did have some VC activity 20 years ago, as I, as I explained, but we're in some ways still seen as first time fund managers. Uh, even though we are part of the African Invest Group, you know, this is our first uh, full Pan-African or international VC experience as an institution. And so a lot of uh, potential LPC as first time managers. And we expect that with the growing track record on the VC front with the quality of the portfolio that we're building and hopefully with some exits down the road, we can make that process a bit easier. Uh, the other thing that uh, I could uh, think of is uh, um, exposure to some to some countries um, that uh, can create um, uh, some 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 risks down the road. Mm. Um, you know, uh, political risk, uh, interest rate risk, um, currency devaluation, right. um, and so. We try to think of ways to mitigate those risks. Um, first, by limiting the percentage of the fund that we invest in a, in a dedicated or specific country. Uh, we also like to, to think that with the type of companies we invest in, uh, these are international platforms that with where innovation doesn't have any borders or, or frontiers. And so revenues can come from different kinds of places and users and customers can also be international. So the reduces some of that risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously political risk that also comes into play where uh, people have uh, 
a lot of uh, perception issues with that. Uh, but that's that's a deeper topic that I can explain in a short period of time. <laughs> I mean, I think what it sounds like is a lot of the challenges are really based on um, issues around perception and really just the nascence of the venture capital industry in general and getting people to buy in, right? There aren't enough successes to point to just yet. I mean, I think we're seeing a lot of really exciting things, right? With Paystack and Flutterwave and a couple of the, the mergers and acquisitions that happened um, last year. But yeah, it's still very early days. So it seems like it's more, and not to make it sound like, you know, these are going to be just like issues that are, will go away, but it sounds like it's just the growing in growing pains of the of the industry. Absolutely, and, well, and we always say that potential and opportunity are over are understated, and mm. uh, geopolitical risk is overstated. So there's yeah. so much coverage of political risk in Africa that sometimes it can cloud the opportunity. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that there isn't any risk. There is. It's just perceived differently. I mean, we lived for four years under a Trump era. That's also very risky, right? <laughs> but we're talking about doing business risk, just like yeah. anywhere else. It's about knowing how to operate and navigate these environments. Um, mm -hmm. So we have to be aware of how um, of it and, and how it affects uh, the uh, investments or potential investments we're about to make. Uh, but but it's not um, perfect anywhere uh, in the world. So it's, yeah. it's really about um, knowing your markets and your audience. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I'll, I'll pull in some questions from the audience. Um, we have a question from Kenneth uh, asking about what opportunities there are that exceed 300 million for infrastructure or boots. And Kenneth, if you want to clarify what boots is, I don't know what that is. Maybe you do, Omar. I'm not sure. <laughs> Sorry. Well, maybe I'll I'll let him clarify and just move on to the next one. Um, okay. Are there NTFs being used in the market? I guess are <laughs> are you experiencing any any um, momentum in that space? NTFs, uh, as in uh, yeah, as in blockchain non, NTFs. Non no. Yeah, and we're not. Um, we haven't seen a strong deal flow of opportunities in that space. Um, and I think it's still uh, early worldwide. Uh, I think it's even more earlier uh, in this side of the world. Um, so as I mentioned, we look at, uh, um, we're not necessarily opportunistic uh, in, in a specific product. Uh, we're more uh, interested in, in companies that have the ambition to structure themselves and be and, and scale their operations, teams operations and activities to, to through a, a sustainable uh, uh, and impactful business model. Yeah. Um, An another question was, uh, do you get involved in any DNVB startups? I'm also not sure what that acronym is. Maybe you do. Um, I did not actually. The second Sorry. part of the question is, is there any preference between B2C versus B2B for uh, the investments you're looking at? Yeah, that's a good question. We look at both. Um, you know, consumer facing have a completely different uh, uh, business proposition and business setup in terms of operating model. Um, so the metrics we look at on a B2B side are different from the ones we look at a B2C side. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's really about understanding what the company really does, um, how they're positioned, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 how how they think they can, they can, uh, they can win uh, in a sustainable manner. So we don't necessarily have a preference for B2B or P2C. We look at both. Uh, and, uh, it, and, and once again, it's about making sure that the addressable market is large enough, that yeah. their margins are interesting and can be protected over time. Mm. It's about uh, making sure that the model is scalable uh, without uh, capital investments. Uh, so purely uh, an asset light basis. We like asset light models and that's the only thing we look at uh, from a, an investment perspective. And then that there is enough appetite in the market um, that people would be willing to pay a premium for these type of platforms at scale. So these are some of the things, the key things that we look at as we assess opportunities in the market. Oh. Um, another, another question here from Alban is, um, you know, what are you all doing as a fund to address the low perception, uh, low investor perception on investment opportunities on the continent? 
Uh, this is a layup one, and I'm going to give a layup answer. We try to do good work. <laughs> uh, we try to do good work, uh, professional, serious work. Um, and we try to promote entrepreneurship. I mentioned earlier that we're entrepreneurs ourselves, and, and we try to really go out to work every day, uh, tr uh, trying to support entrepreneurs and help them solve the, the problems that they face on a daily basis, right? Uh, beyond selecting the right opportunity, it's really first understanding what their what their model is, what they're trying to solve and help find solutions along their way. Um, that's really what we do on a daily basis. And, and so as we do that, uh, investors will see the traction over time. And so slowly but surely we're building cases for ourselves where yeah. we see, we show, show that the, we're building the building blocks of uh, a, a scalable model where we really believe that venture capital has not only its importance in all asset classes in the market today to support um, uh, youth employment, to support uh, employment in general, to support, to, to provide financial inclusion, to provide access to healthcare, education, uh, uh, et cetera, for investors to really get excited, both on the private side and on the public side. So today, uh, you're right, most of our LPs are still uh, develop finan development finance institutions, with, yeah. without which we wouldn't be uh, able to do what we do today. Uh, let's, let's, call, let's call it as it is. Uh, but we see more and more interest from private investors. And so we're starting to have corporations join um, and, and the investor base of our, uh, our fund. So we just received commitments from a very large corporate in Europe for the first time in, in African invest history. So that's exciting. So and it sends very strong signals to the market that, okay, now corporations are starting to look elsewhere. They're starting to look at the, for the next layer of growth through partners that can do a professional work and, and, and give them a good chance of... Uh, achieving that potential. It makes me wonder too, because I, I, I feel like one of the biggest challenges for the, the global market in general is just lack of access to data and information and market research. And so it makes me wonder, you know, and not that this is African Invest's job per se to share this information, right? Like, I think that there's something to be said for having that as proprietary data. Um, but it does, you know, I think make me wonder to what extent some white papers are published or, you know what I mean, like some of the data becomes at least to some extent accessible so that I think for those that are just curious, it's like, oh, there's actually some interesting reports I can read about what the trends are um, at, a, I think, at a more tangible level instead of like high level, like, yes, opportunity, right? Um, it, it, just something that I think is interesting because it's for me it's like where where does the data live right the data exists but it's privately held and not necessarily yeah right not to put the responsibility on anyone to liberate that but um it's it's there no you're right I mean uh, uh, there is all sorts of data out there um and yeah. uh, depending on the on the on the profile of the person seeking the data or seeking to analyze that data it could be used in many different ways and, and accessed many different ways as well. Um, and so um, the, the question is quite broad, so I'm not uh, yeah, exactly sure how, how to address it, but um, we, we uh, <laughs> just if I look back at, at, at African Invest history, because it's the closest example, this is an institution that's been gathering data for 20, uh, 27 years. Right, uh, and so, and we still don't know everything, yeah. <laughs> and we're not even close. And so, I think as we continue to grow and go through experiences and meet entrepreneurs and 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 face issues, that's how we continue to learn, and and hopefully we can continue to find solutions. There are a number of questions still in the chat, so I apologize to folks whose questions we won't be able to get to. Um, I do want to start winding down, and and Omar, I'll just ask kind of a a closing question to you on, um, you know, what do you think or what do you feel is something that's overstated about the opportunities that you're that you're seeing and in in, in kind of just generally investing on the continent? And then what would you say is understated? Yeah, we touched a bit upon this. I think uh, what's understated is, is the opportunity. You know, you mentioned that Paystack that was acquired by Stripe. Well, you, you mentioned Flutterwave that just raised the over 160 million dollars in, in an exciting series C round. 
Um, you know, we can talk about Fowry in Egypt that IPO the $2 billion right. a couple of years ago. So, so there are some very strong signals in the market that are starting to put African tech and African innovation on the map. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, it's still very early stage, um, but it's, uh, it's growing and it's growing very fast and in a structured fashion. We have, we see more and more funds being structured. We see more and more people and, and investors coming in to join these funds to support entrepreneurs. Uh, you see the growth of innovation hubs beyond the four main ones that I described. Uh, mm -hmm. There are over 600 innovation hubs in Africa. Um, so you have the satellite uh, regions in Morocco, Tunisia, Ivory Coast, Senegal, Rwanda, Tanzania, um, Ghana. I mean, a lot of countries are really starting to promote entrepreneurship. And so that's, that's for me, is understated. Um, yeah. And what's overstated is the perception thing, uh, risk that we described. Yeah. And so my advice to people who really want to um, go into this and, and, and understand a bit what goes on, just make sure you know the facts. Uh, make sure you know the facts, look at the data. We're happy to, to, to share some of that data uh, because I think there's room for everyone. Um, and, and speaking from personal experience uh, where I was exposed to opportunities through the private equity investment landscape in the US, I still decided to move back to Africa given the vast fragmentation across several sectors and industries, right? And um, in fact, and I'll close with the, with the interesting stats, by 2050, half of Africans are forecasted to be the, under the age of 25. 30% yeah. uh, of annual growth rates is expected in university enrollment. Um, today, we have over 500 million, 500 million mobile users. Uh, and that's a number that's expected to scale exponentially. And so if we consider that time is our most sacred uh, commodity, um, then uh, there's no better testament than, than being involved ourselves. Um, Omar, this has been filled with so many juicy, insightful, um, I think bits of information and, and you know, I'm, I'm just very grateful for you sharing your time and your expertise and your wisdom. Um, very excited to continue to watch kind of what evolves with the fund. Um, yeah, I just want to say a big thank you, and I and I hope to those in the audience um, that you found this insightful. And um, I suppose maybe the question is, uh, are you open to people reaching out? I imagine there's some entrepreneurs in the audience curious if if people want to follow the journey. Um, what would be a good way to to engage with you or or the fund more broadly? Now, please, I uh, would be more than happy to connect with anyone that's interested in, in learning more. Um, feel free to reach out to, to me directly on, on LinkedIn or on Twitter, um, and uh, I'll do my best to respond as in a timely fashion, and uh, I look forward to connecting. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Omar. Thank you, everyone who joined. Um, I'll have a recording of this up in probably a week or so for those that want to um, revisit it or share it. So, yeah. Thanks again, Omar. Have a great Thank evening. Thank you so much, Alicia, for organizing and all the best. Cheers. Yeah, same. Bye. Bye-bye.